So welcome to all you Rotarians on this beautiful October fall day. Welcome to Rotary. We're happy to be here. Thank you both for joining us today as our greeters. Thank you to all the Rotarians who are here today. Today is October 1st, and we welcome you to another wonderful Rotary program. We have two guests joining us today, and I'd like to have them both uh, just unmute very quickly and say hello. We've got Stacy Short, who is the guest of David Cobia. Stacy, may you, would you please say hello? All right, well, he hearing not from Stacy, perhaps there's some audio issues there, but uh, Ryan Siefkin, who is a guest of Leanne Antonio, would you be able to unmute and say hello? So oh, Ryan just let me know that he, they don't have a microphone. <laughs> all right. Fair enough, fair enough. We'll move on. If we were sitting at our rotary tables, we'd all yell out a hearty here and they'd be able to stand up and wave and welcome. But uh, unfortunately, Zoom does have its limitations. So we'll carry on. But thank you for joining us as a guest. We are indeed people of action and our Rotarians are going places. So with that, we're going to get started with our music with Linda Kaminsky. Thank you. So... Uh, John Philip Sousa was born in Washington, D.C. in 1854 and died in 1932. He is known as the March King, and he composed 136 American military marches. His father, Antonio, played trombone in the United States Marine Corps Band. At age six, his father enrolled him in a variety of music classes, including voice, violin, piano, flute, cornet, euphonium, trombone, and alto horn. At age 13, his father enlisted him as an apprentice in the United States Marine Corps Band. On this day, October 1st, 1880, exactly 140 years ago, he was named director of the United States Marine Corps Band, which he led for over 10 years. Today, we're going to listen to his most famous march, which is also known as America's National March, the Stars and Stripes Forever, performed by the United States Marine Corps Band. John Philip Sousa led the Marine Band to new heights of popularity during his tenure as leader from 1880 to 1892. It was during this era that he earned the title, the March King, a well-deserved nickname that continues to this day. Of the 136 marches he composed, one has stood out above all the rest. It was composed in 1896 as Sousa sailed back home from a long European vacation. The inspiration for this march was born of a combination of homesickness, fond memories of his time as leader of the Marine Band, and his stirring recollection of the American flag flying over the White House. The resulting march became his best known work, and in 1987, it officially became our national march, the Stars and Stripes Forever.
much, Linda. That's wonderful. That'll put a pep in your step all day long. Thank you. Next, we've got David Links with our invocation. David. Thank you. Um, my friend Leo Carver wrote this, and I thought it was appropriate for the times that we are living in. He's, he calls it the tips to release control and trust the universe. Our society places value on staying in control and creating a life that is always organized, structured, and planned. It is a practice that, we, that can leave you stressed and depressed. So first, embrace helplessness. Sometimes when you're at your most desperate, you shine the brightest because in these moments, you've arrived at the point of surrender. Draw strength from simply by letting go of the struggle, ceasing to resist and embrace your inability to control the situation. Next, tune into love. Love is the force that moves the entire universe. Love is grace, love is helping, love is caring and sharing, love is tolerance and understanding. Next, release what you cannot hold. As a part of your growth process, try to learn to relax and let go of your control. Allow yourself to experience with wonderment. You may find that the unknown is more favorable than your tight hold on life. Next, observe nature. Look at how bountiful and giving nature really is. Observe the beauty and synchronicity of it all. As much as you may feel like a stranger here, you and your life are no accident. The entire universe has conspired to give you experience. Next, show gratitude. When you express gratitude, the world will naturally soften and brighten for you. There is something powerful about being authentically thankful to the universe. Then increase self-awareness. Awareness of your thoughts is important to all self-evolving practices. The more you listen to your own mind, the more you will realize the role it plays in your life. Learn to trust and cooperate with the universe. Listen to your intuition. The importance of intuition cannot be overstated. This guidance comes from within the soul and is directly linked to the rest of the universe. Listen to it. Acknowledge life's grace. Every person has known suffering of some kind. Sometimes you may tend to focus more on the negatives and then on the grace that life bestows on you. If you're seeking to build a relationship of trust with the universe, try to spend time focusing on how good it is to you. Then seek oneness. Your fear and control seeking arise from concern about the unknown. Engage the world more so that you are more comfortable. Try looking at life as well as yourself from different perspectives and embrace it all. This powerful act can bring harmony and trust into your awareness and will release your desire to control everything. Thank you. Thank you, David, very much. For those of you who didn't see the uh, preview of the meeting, this is our new kitty, Salem. She's going to go live with her daughter. So if you hear her meowing in the background, please forgive me. She just found her voice today in time for Rotary. So she's uh, joining us as a guest for Rotary today. So please forgive any background noise. So I did want to move on to an announcement, a reminder about Operation Harvest coming up this Saturday. If you are signed up to collect food, don't forget that data on your calendar. If you're going to be signed up to the pickup, or excuse me, to be at the collection site, remember that is at State Fair Park this year, not at the Salvation Army. So don't forget, make sure that you take those bags to State Fair Park, where we're going to be socially distanced collecting that food. And many thanks to the volunteers who have already dropped those bags off on those routes. We really appreciate all of those efforts. Each of you had about 150 bags to distribute. We had 10,000 total bags that are dropped off in the community to help remind people to put it on the porch on Saturday. So many thanks to all of our volunteers, our chair people, 
Sony Alexander and Ward Sutton have done just a tremendous job. Also thanks to David McKinney, to Carolyn and Delorna who uh, joined me last Friday to make sure that folks got those bags in time for those routes. So many thanks to all of you volunteers. It's gonna be a wonderful Saturday and we're looking forward to hearing the results of that food drive. So next up, sorry, you can't drop my agenda. <laughs> We've got Sergeant at Arms with Nat Martinkus. Nat. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, well, this is my first crack at doing this virtually, so uh, <laughs> bear with me. So uh, coming up with something new and uh, that fits, I, I racked my brain on this one for a while, but uh, on a recent trip up to visit my son, who's a freshman up at Eastern, uh, we went out and grabbed dinner at a pizza pub and got roped into their trivia night. Uh, which was kind of fun. I'd never done that with Drew before. And uh, I had to explain to him that, you know, he's in good shape because his father uh, retains a lot of what uh, most people would think is useless information, um, but uh, used to be quite, uh, quite a valuable uh, commodity before people had smartphones. People would, you know, what is this or what is that? And I normally had the answer to it. It was pop culture or history or just off the wall stuff. He got into science or math. I would, I'd be wrecked. But uh, kind of like the buggy whip guy, uh, it, it became quite useless and, until uh, trivia nights or, or rotary meetings. So uh, we're gonna play to my strength here because no one gets to use a cell phone on, on this one or shouldn't be, uh, I guess rules may be different now, but uh, so a four-way test applies. Uh, what I'll do is I'm gonna ask you guys a couple, you know, a bunch of random trivia. Uh, if, you, uh, if you know the answer, great. If you don't, you can uh, send some money off to, to Carolyn or ask her to bill you she'd be happy to do that too uh as usual the fines are a buck and we'll just uh kind of get going with there we'll uh we'll start with the first one which was one my sister and brother-in-law uh hit me up on years ago when they're out on a date night uh prior to smartphones uh and we're pretty amazed that i came up with this one right off the top of my head so uh since we're a a, a a group that may appreciate this. What is the name of the fraternal organization that Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble belong to? So this is the silence part that uh, is, is a killer when you're sitting in this seat. Uh, it is the Order of Water Buffalo. If you knew that, you're great. If not, please uh, send Carolyn some money. Uh, moving on to, to movies, which was uh, mainly what we were asked at our trivia night up at Eastern. Oh, by the way, we took second and should have taken first, but uh, we didn't follow the directions completely. So anyway, uh, a little tangent. In the movie Forrest Gump, Forrest talks about the men in his platoon while on patrol in Vietnam. There was Dallas from Phoenix. Cleveland was from Detroit. And then there was Tex. Does anyone know where Tex was from? It's a trick question because Forrest didn't know where, trick, where Tex was from. So anyway, we always get a laugh at that one. Uh, one other que one question that we got from the trivia night that I thought was pretty good uh, was given that we were up near Spokane, which Rat Pack member was a native of Spokane? And he assured us that this guy was a Rat Pack member. But uh, for those of you who, who probably have an idea of this, it's Bing Crosby. Uh, after we answered that question, Drew knew who Bing Crosby was, but he didn't know who the Rat Pack was. So I'm going to go out here on a limb because we've had a youth movement maybe in, in the Rotary Club here. If you don't know who the Rat Pack is, you can pay a buck. But uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll move on to maybe the next one. Uh, can you name a Brat Pack member? I just need one. Give you guys a minute to think about that one. So we would take Emilio Estevez, Anthony Michael Hall, Rob Lowe, Andrew McCarthy, Demi Moore, Judd Nelson, Molly Ringwald, or Ali Sheedy. Scroll up the teleprompter here. <clears throat> which in which 80s sitcom, which 80s sitcom title was the acronym of its main character whose real name was Gordon Shumway? That would be ALF. It's terrible, the stuff that haunts me on this one. That one, actually, I, I did know that one right off the top of my head. Uh, this one, given current times, I like uh, another movie quote. In the movie Casablanca, Captain Renault tells Rick he's shutting down his cafe because he's shocked, shocked to find that there's gambling going on here. <clears throat> the question is, 
what is it, what, <clears throat> what does the cafe employee hand Captain Renault? You're winning, sir, to which the captain says, thank you, thank you very much. A scene replay almost daily in politics, so everyone enjoy that one. Okay, and as it is fall and we have uh, Pac-12 is scheduled to play again, and because of President Jennifer and I share a love of uh, a certain college football team, uh, what is the name of the WSU alum who is currently the, a starting quarterback in the NFL? As a layup, it's Gardner Minshew. <clears throat> what is the name of the University of Washington alum who's a starting quarterback in the NFL? Kind of like the poor Gump question, there isn't one. So my little dig at the Huskies for President Jennifer. <clears throat> Many of you know that there is a cougar flag at every ESPN college game day show. The show travels different uh, to different colleges campuses every week. So it's quite a feat to get the flag volunteers uh, there to wave it every weekend. The current streak uh, of consecutive game day appearances is 245 as of last weekend. Does anyone know what year the streak started? That is 2003. So and longer than I've had my youngest son. So he just, uh, he's pushing 17. <clears throat> so uh, speaking of the college game day flag, uh, you know, I had earlier, I had a picture up of me waving the flag. I happened to be in uh, Des Moines, Iowa the weekend they were doing it in names, which is about 40 miles away at Iowa State for the Iowa State, Iowa game. Truly a fun time. While I was on that trip, I, uh, I have some very good friends in Des Moines who introduced me to a cocktail called, uh, that I refer to as a Des Moines martini. And now I don't expect any of you to know what a Des Moines martini is. I will tell you what it is. It is a Coors Light with olives and it's a pretty good game day drink. And if you think that sounds good, great. If you think it sounds terrible, pay a buck. So anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate all of that wonderful Sergeant Arms trivia. And I promise I did not pay you at all to come up with any of the coup questions. Oh, so. uh, no, I paid WSU to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much. Next, we've got Leanne Antonio to introduce our speaker panel today. Leanne. Yes. Thank you, President Jennifer. Uh, welcome, fellow Rotarians. Affordable housing is a hot topic and considered a critical need across the United States. While housing in Yakima may seem more affordable than in other parts of our state, the need for more affordable housing has been identified as a priority by city and county leaders. So today we've invited the leaders of three area organizations that are actively providing affordable housing in Yakima County. And they're going to speak to us today on that topic. They include Low Kruger, who's the executive director of the Yakima Housing Authority, Brian Ketchum, director of Catholic Charities Housing Services for the Diocese of Yakima, and Melanie Rosen, the executive director of Yakima Valley Partners Habitat for Humanity. This will be a panel discussion. If you have questions, I'm going to attempt to monitor the chat, but we hope to have some Q&A time at the end of the program. So I've asked each of the speakers to start out by introducing themselves, including what led them to work in affordable housing and ask them to include an overview of the model their agency uses to provide affordable housing in our area. And we're gonna start with Lowell, followed by Brian and then Melanie. Good afternoon, Rotarians and guests. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to you this afternoon. And by the way, I do have my bag for Operation Harvest. So thank you for whoever dropped that off at my house. I will be uh, putting something in there for this uh, Saturday. Um, I am, uh, well, I was born and raised here in Yakima. So for me, when we start talking about uh, affordable housing and what it means uh, to this community, it really is a community issue. And it really is something that strikes the heart of uh, my heart with regards to how we as a community come together and support time. So the authorities, we have basically a two-pronged model as to how we provide affordable housing uh, to our community. 
One is we develop, own, and manage a variety of units, over 500 units throughout our, the Yakima communities. And for us, although we're the housing authority of the city of Yakima, we do have intermunicipal agreements uh, with a variety of municipalities across the uh, county. So we do have, for instance, housing in Granger, Toppenish, Kawichi, Titan, outside of the city of Yakima. Uh, so that is one way that we provide. And, and with regards to that housing, I, I just want to be, I want to talk a little bit about who we house with regards uh, to that housing. We primarily house uh, individuals that are elderly or disabled. We have a couple facilities in the city of Yakima. One is Glen Acres, another one is uh, Natchez House. Um, and we're in the process of possibly acquiring a property down Zilla as well. That would continue that. Um, we house uh, uh, farm workers across our community. You'll see that a lot throughout uh, the Granger or Toppenish areas. We do have some in Yakima, but also Kawichi and Titan. We house a lot of families, but I think probably one that, that most people are familiar with has been in the news quite a bit is uh, veterans um, and the project that we're doing with the former Marine Armory off of 16th Avenue. That is currently under construction and we anticipate that being done uh, probably the, uh, the middle of this next year where we'll be able to start leasing that up. So that is one way that we provide affordable housing across the community. Another way that we do uh, is we also administer what's called the Housing Choice Voucher Program, oftentimes uh, referred to as Section 8. And for that, we actually administer that for two counties, both Yakima and Kittitas counties. And for the Housing Authority, we administer approximately about, about 1,200 vouchers uh, that covers about, uh, let me see, we have utilizing not quite 1,100 individuals and families that are utilizing that program right now. And that goes to subsidize individuals' rent. So they may be uh, you know, renting from, if you are a landlord, renting from property that you own or from some nonprofit properties. But that right there is our way of being able to help maintain affordability is by providing a rent subsidy. And there are some specialty areas within, with regards to the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So it's not just uh, for strictly just straight families. There are um, a couple, so one of the specialty programs is the VASH program, which is specific to veterans. And that does come in addition to uh, services provided by the VA. We also have vouchers as specific to what's called non-elderly disabled or individuals under the age of 62, but need additional assistance. Those also receive services. And the other one that we have here in Yakima are now called our mainstream vouchers. And those also come with services, particularly with, um, uh, with, um, and with the Department of, uh, of, of Health and, and Human Services. So those right there, they're, they're not just, they're primarily focused on individuals that have experienced homelessness, but they also come with services. So really, as, as I wrap up here with regards to this question, those, it's really a two-pronged approach. It's owned units that we develop and we own and manage, but it's also the voucher program that really reaches out and helps our community. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Brian Ketchum with Catholic Charities Housing Services uh, and wanted to thank you all for inviting us to be here today. A special thanks to Leanne for putting the uh, panel together uh, and just really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you all a little bit about uh, the work that we do um, at Catholic Charities uh, around affordable housing. Um, but first let me just start by introducing myself. Um, you know, I grew up in the Yakima Valley. Um, it was born in Renton. My parents lived there uh, and I moved to Yakima about three months after <laughs> I was born. So I spent uh, all of my formative years here in the Valley. Um, graduated uh, from Pacific Lutheran University with a degree in history and philosophy. Uh, quickly learned that that was not very employable. Um, and uh, after traveling and working for a few years, I went back to school and um, got a master's degree in international relations with a focus on international development. And so uh, I kind of fell into this career in affordable housing as I was looking for work after grad school and um, got hired by a local nonprofit, um, the name of Office of Rural and Farmworker Housing as a housing development consultant. And, um, and what I found personally for me and just working in this industry was that um, my, my, my kind of theoretical background was looking at how countries develop. What are those factors internally and externally that contribute to 
uh, developing successful economies and addressing those issues of, of poverty. And uh, what I found in taking this job, starting it as a development consultant was really, um, it, it, it checked off a few boxes in, in my, my goals. Um, one was I wanted to work internationally and uh, working with a farm worker community that's predominantly uh, immigrant community kind of checked that, that box off. Um, working on development issues and issues of poverty uh, was really central to, uh, to my goal. Um, and, and one of the things that I kind of discovered or rediscovered and found that was so inspiring, I think, in working in, uh, in this industry was that um, you really have an opportunity to see and, and witness the impact of affordable housing on the families and the centrality of home uh, for each one of us and what that means, uh, you know, as you grow up or as a parent now for me, reflecting on, uh, you know, the home and experiences that we want to create for our own children. Um, and so for me, this was a perfect merge between this kind of theoretical concepts of development and the practicalities of addressing issues of poverty and creating opportunities for families. Um, so, so that um, my personal background in terms of, of what drives me in this work and inspires me uh, every day. Um, for Catholic Charities Housing Services, so we are a nonprofit 501c3. Um, we, um, we develop, own, and manage affordable uh, multifamily rental housing. Um, about We have just over 900 units in the seven counties that we serve that make up central Washington. Um, about 35%, 40% of those units are here in Yakima County. About another 35% are in Grant County, uh, and then Benton uh, and uh, Chelan. About 70% of all of our units serve farm workers and their families. So we're very heavily focused on farm worker issues um, and, and what those challenges are, uh, not just in terms of affordable housing, but also just in terms of um, issues around uh, assimilation and, and access to opportunities in the local communities, awareness of what opportunities are available. Um, and that also ties us into issues around uh, you know, immigration and, um, and uniquely the importance of farm workers um, that support the economy in the valley. Um, and, and most recently acknowledged as farm workers being essential workers during this time of COVID. Uh, the remaining housing units, uh, we have um, a little over 100 units serving seniors and elders um, and independent living. Um, and we recently completed our first permanent supportive housing serving individuals and families experiencing homelessness up in Wenatchee. Uh, and that development actually uh, leased up uh, during COVID, which was uh, a very challenging and unique time to try and um, meet with residents and clients and, uh, and get them qualified. In addition to the multifamily side, we also have a home ownership program um, and we've developed two different models for uh, creating opportunities for low-income families to become first-time home buyers and begin really to build equity um, and, and, and build assets that allows them to move out of poverty. Um, just a quick overview of those two programs. There's one that's referred to as a mutual self-help where uh, the unique elements of that program are that families sign a group labor agreement. So they, we pre-qualify families in groups of between six and 12 and those families sign a, a, an agreement where they will work on each other's homes and do 65% of the labor component on the, the home. And our role is to provide the technical assistance that teaches them how to build their own homes and oversee that construction. So families do about 1,100 hours or so of sweat equity on their homes over about a nine or to 10 month period. Um, and when it's complete, uh, they'll have about 25 to $30,000 worth of equity in their home. Uh, which on average is a year's worth of income for those families. Uh, so it is a transformational uh, program. Um, it builds community as you're building your home um, and it puts families on a path that they now have a, an asset uh, to um, build against and to leverage to help their children, uh, you know, in many cases, uh, 
we leverage our homes to allow our kids to go to college or universities. The second program is an, what we refer to as an individual self-help um, and also known as a self-help light. So in, in that model, um, families only have to work on their own home um, and they agree to do 250 hours of sweat equity on their home, predominantly doing uh, laminate floor installations and landscaping. Um, and what they get in, in exchange is a $2,500 credit at closing, uh, which essentially allows a family to get into a home with no money down. So if, if a down payment was your barrier into achieving home ownership, we can help address that issue. Um, and at the end, the home is fully leveraged when you first buy it. So it's a, we use a lending uh, program through the USDA, which is known as the Section 502 Direct Loan Program which is available for residents in rural communities. Um, and they provide um, up to like 103, 105% of loan to value uh, that helps families get into home ownership. It's a, it's a fantastic program. Um, and I would say about 95% of our uh, home buyers uh, uh, choose this program in terms of mortgage lending finance. So, so those are kind of our two programs. Um, our single family program, just to give you a sense of scale over the last 15 years, uh, we've uh, built and sold uh, just over 200 homes um, in, in that program, predominantly in Yakima County uh, and just a few homes in Benton County. Uh, but as we continue to look to expand and serve the broader central Washington region. So. With that, I'll turn it over to Melanie. Thanks, Brian. And thank you all for inviting me to join you here today. Um, I'm excited to, to participate in this panel. Um, I am Melanie Rosen, the Executive Director for Yakima Valley Partners Habitat for Humanity. I'm relatively new in the affordable housing arena. Um, Brian and Lowell um, have significantly more experience than I do. However, I've found my experience in business management, insurance, construction, retail, and real estate uh, give me sufficient knowledge to draw from and to do my job. I am the youngest of five children born and raised here in Yakima Valley. Growing up, I learned I could do anything with enough help and support, a natural collaborator. My mom always enjoyed telling the story of my first day in kindergarten when I had to ride the school bus to get to school because we lived in the country. And I marched up to the school bus real proud of myself. I was off to school for the first time, you know, the youngest of five, eager to do everything my siblings had done and found that I couldn't actually get on the bus because I was too short. And tried as I might, I couldn't make the step. And so, after two or three tries, I shrugged a little bit, turned to the boy behind me waiting to get on the bus and asked him to shove me on the step because I knew once I got to one step, I'd be able to make it. And he obliged and off I went. Um, many laughs have been had at the family home for how hard I tried to get on the school bus. Um, hard to believe I was ever that small, honestly, but um, I learned that at that point, you know, you never fail as long as you keep trying. And so I don't believe anyone ever achieves success alone. And I've continued my life through that process. Uh, raised in a large tight-knit family, I also um, have found that I draw on the strength of my network. And I realized as a young adult that that is really what community is, a tight-knit family. All boats will rise and fall with the tide. And while we may not have the same destination planned, if we work together, we're all likely to reach the shore we're looking for. I also believe that God created the long windy road that drove me to Habitat. Uh, to prepare me for all the different things that I would be overseeing as the executive director here. Uh, and I use those experiences pretty much daily, whether it's working with staff, current or potential homeowners, community partners, and board members. My passion for affordable housing stems from my belief, supported by many studies, that housing is the foundation for what I call the success trio, health, education, and happiness. As a single mom of three, I worked hard to overcome housing struggles, the typical issues overcrowding, affordability, safety, and location. I first worked hard to establish just stable housing. And from there, I focused on home ownership. And once I, you know, I was able to make that goal, I, it was fortunate for me that I have a great network, a strong family that was able to help me reach that goal. Uh, once I'd experienced the benefits of home ownership, my passion shifted to helping others reach that same goal. And lo and behold, here I am at Habitat, helping to help people make that goal happen for them. Habitat is an international organization. Um, our mission on a global level is putting God's love into action, bringing people together 
building homes, community, and hope. And our vision is a world with every, where everyone has a decent place to live. Our program uses a self-help model to earn home ownership. Yakima Valley Partners Habitat for Humanity was originally Buena Partners and the first habitat in Washington State, established in 1984. Our store here in Yakima is the largest habitat store in the Northwest. So we have some great uh, um, opportunities here in Yakima, which I'm very proud of. Our home build program has built 192 homes in Yakima County. And through our tithing program, we've built 150 homes outside of the US. We've also supported numerous global village builds where groups, small groups will gather together and travel to other areas like El Salvador, or Nepal, some other areas that Habitat has locations and build homes. Many of those have been led by a previous board member and a fellow Rotarian for you, Bruce Willis. Our organization spends 87 cents on the dollar building homes for our program. Our store profits help us to build about three homes a year. In my first year with Habitat, we built and sold 11 homes, providing safe, decent, affordable housing to 48 individuals and adding $2.8 million in property values. The program utilizes volunteerism, community partners. We partner with Perry Tech, OIC, and NCAC for build programs, and then also ONDS and Yakima County Home Consortium for funding. The hard work of our homeowners, of course, we all call that sweat equity. Uh, eligibility requirements for the program include income earnings between 30 and 80 percent of the area median income, a credit score of, of 640 or higher in order to obtain a mortgage. Um, families must contribute a minimum of 500 hours of sweat equity performed by the primarily the immediate family of the household and a willingness to partner with Habitat. They're also required to be a citizen or a permanent resident of, of the United States and be able to represent an ability to repay the cost of our homes. On average, our homes cost about $150,000, depending on the grants that are available and the cost of land acquisition. Mortgages come in three forms. We partner with the USDA program, much like Catholic Charities, for our low interest subsidized loans. And then we also have a special program with Yakima Federal Savings and Loan, where they offer a reduced interest loan program specifically designed for Habitat. And our office provides two to three loans a year that are 0% interest. Using third-party lenders has increased the number of homes our program can offer per year by 75%. So we focus primarily on single-family home new construction. It's a small piece of the puzzle for addressing affordable housing needs in Yakima County. And we're very fortunate to have partners um, or similar organizations in our community like Yakima Housing Authority and Catholic Charities to help address the additional needs for affordable housing in our community. And that's the basics of our program. Thank you, Melanie, Brian, and Lowell. So next, I've asked each of the speakers to um, speak to the greatest challenges or barriers that they see to affordable housing in our area and to include what they see as potential solutions. And this time we're gonna have Melanie uh, go first, followed by Lowell and then Brian. Well, honestly, being the panel member that has the least experience in affordable housing, I'm sure Lowell and Brian will have more insight into this question. But from my limited experience, I see typical barriers for affordable housing um, as the lack of available units. Uh, we continue to see shortages every year for available units. Cost of housing statistically we see one in six households are paying more than 30% of their monthly income for housing, which is our threshold for affordability in, within Habitat. Uh, and then many of those are also are spending more than 50% of their income, which forces them to decide between housing costs and food or other necessities. Unsafe or unhealthy housing, creating a lack of stability uh, in the housing market. Limited or no access to affordable land for construction. Zoning and permitting cost and limitations. Um, the overall increased cost of materials for construction, code requirements that are also increasing the cost of construction, uh, the burden for families to save down payments or deposits, uh, and then the current volatility of our economy. Some of the simple solutions or the solutions that I see that might be um, effective in our community is first, we must recognize that affordable housing is a whole community concern. It's not a concern for the people that are looking for housing, it's a concern for everyone. And solving the housing gap benefits all residents of our community. Um, and another potential solution might be to reduce fees and incentivize sellers selling to bona fide affordable housing programs. Um, right now, when you sell a home or a property, you're responsible to pay excise tax and some other fees. 
And if we could work with the county on maybe adjusting that, giving that a reduction of some sort, that would be a great help to us, I believe. Um, and the same with permits. We spend a lot of money on permitting. Uh, it's, it's mind boggling to me. I, I, we started a recent development of 10 houses here in Yakima where I just to get the plans to start infrastructure to build a road and put in the water and sewer that the city will benefit from. I spent $10,000 just for the paperwork. Um, and then I'm gonna have to pay for the cost of building those roads. And the city is really who benefits from that. Uh, so I think uh, if we can find a way to maybe reduce or stretch out some of those expenses, that would be a great opportunity for us. Um, and also uh, we need to continue to bolster and support down payment assistance programs. There's several out there. The Federal Home Lending Bank offers a great program. Yakima Fed has a program. And I know there's others out there for other lending programs. Um, so we need to support those to help families get into homes. And then also maybe look into options to support landlords, landlords or buyers of units in the affordable market for renovations and updates so that they're not renting out homes that are outdated or unhealthy or unsafe. And with that, Lowell, I'm going to pass it on to you. Thank you, Melanie. Um, you had many of the same items, I'm sure both Brian and I had on our list. Um, but I would, uh, I would add on to that just a little bit. Um, one example I would uh, provide is uh, certainly as we take a look at Yakima as it becomes a larger and larger metropolitan area, I think it's fair to compare it to other metropolitan areas. And one that I certainly have become more familiar with, uh, with my time uh, in the affordable housing arena has been the Seattle King County metropolitan area. So when you talk about the lack of affordable housing that we have throughout Yakima, I always take a look at, for instance, uh, University of Washington's Rundstad Center does a survey uh, every spring and fall with regards to um, occupancy. And certainly for Yakima, we've experienced occupancy for the last uh, several studies of 1% or less. And I think this really goes to your point, Melanie, with regards to um, um, just the availability of housing in general. It doesn't matter whether it's somebody of limited means or somebody that's coming in that's new to the area, but is a professional and has means, there's just not much in the way of either housing stock to acquire or to rent. Uh, even the King County Seattle area ranges over the last several studies between three and 6% vacancy rate, which is a, certainly a much healthier uh, environment than what we see here. But even with that, as I sit on a number of state boards, we certainly have had a lot of conversation around uh, what resources are available for those of us that are in the, you know, that develop and manage affordable housing. So in the, in, in the Seattle King County arena, you certainly have um, levies that have been passed by the city of Seattle and other municipalities that have added to resources available, whether it's for single family development, like, uh, like Melanie and, and Brian have been doing, or whether it's for uh, multifamily, primarily what the Yakima Housing Authority and, and Brian as well does. Uh, the other thing that I've seen a lot more recently um, with regards to, to resources has been um, the involvement of Microsoft now that has put forward a pretty large sum of money in the Seattle King County area specific, if you will, to make up for their, uh, their workforce that has uh, certainly uh, used a lot of the housing. And I know there's been uh, pressure and discussion with Amazon as well. But when you take a look at resources that the larger metropolitan areas like a Seattle or King County has versus what we have here in Yakima, there's, there's definitely a large gap there. Um, and so I think when we talk about and look at the lack of, of affordable housing or just lack of housing in general, I think some of it comes back to what resources do we have here locally to be able to add to it. And it doesn't mean that we don't have resources statewide that have been used here. We certainly have, both Brian and I have taken advantage of low-income housing tax credits or Washington State Housing Trust Funds as we've gone through and developed. But that right there really to me is, is an area that we need to look at. In fact, uh, just this week when I met with the new city manager for the city of Yakima, we talked about the fact that Yakima doesn't even have a levy for affordable housing. So I do think that that is something that we need to take a look at and consider uh, in the future. Another item that I think you really hit on, uh, Melanie, was the construction costs. And it doesn't matter whether you're building for affordable housing or, or any housing right now, when you take a look at, um, you know, whether it's the fires or whether it's a hurricane, there's always seems to be a, an increase in costs around that. And certainly for us, uh, we've experienced that with our, with our transition, our, our reformation of the Yakima Marine Army to the Chuck Austin place. Um, just as we were finalizing our bids with our contractors, certainly the cost of construction 
production just just skyrocketed on us. And quite frankly, we had to work with our sub just to be able to make sure that our, our sub didn't go out of business uh, with you know just framing our unit our units up there. So I mean, there's things like that that are certainly affecting us. Uh, and I agree when it comes to additional um, requirements, whether it's code requirements or oftentimes a number of the funding sources that we rely on have additional green requirements uh, that add cost to the construction. Um, one area certainly that we've experienced outside of just the materials costs is, is labor as well. And I have to say for those of us that are utilizing state or other resources that do have wage requirements, um, you know, we have experience with um, wage rate uh, surveys that have been done or have historically been done. Um, there was there was a, certainly an effect uh, the last couple of years with uh, the state LNI increasing wage rates on us. And I have to say, I have to give a big shout out to Senator King, who really helped mightily with us uh, going back to LNI and asking them to do a fair and equitable wage survey to really find out what the market wage wages were. Uh, and so that has that is in the process. This is taking place now, and so we look forward to seeing, I think LNI is going to be releasing those here shortly, but that has also been an effect on our costs as we go forward. So I think there's there's a number of things um, that we can do in relationship to this, as I indicated, with regards to Levy or others, um, and certainly, you know, um, with LNI now redoing the survey, I think will be helpful for us to see what the actual, you know, market does dictate for, for, the, serve, for the wages that we're paying. Um, and with that, um, I, I don't have a lot more to add. Those have been really probably the two big key things for us as we've been looking at and trying to deal with uh, construction uh, and development of our affordable housing. So I'll turn it over to Brian for additional thoughts. Thanks, Lowell. Well, I, I would certainly echo Melanie and Lowell's comments, you know, that, um, you know, the, the lack of resource, the availability of appropriately zoned land if it's multifamily housing, um, the lack of uh, um, the, the lack of infrastructure in particularly in rural communities if you're looking to develop um, often requires an extension of water and sewer uh, and, and or roads which adds significant development costs. Um, I thought I'd, I'd at the risk of uh, you know not wanting to repeat, Lowell and, and Melanie's comments, but just to share a little bit about the broader issues that communities are facing around affordable housing right now. Um, and, and certainly Lowell touched on this, um, uh, is looking at the issue of available housing stock, that, that the issues of affordable housing are not unique to low-income families. These are issues that are impacting every income level in our local communities. The fact that we've had sustained rates of 1% vacancy rates or lower throughout all of central Washington for more than five years is indicative that this is a real crisis. We've not recovered from the housing crisis back in 2008, 2009. The, the level of new construction that's taking place in our communities is not keeping up with, with just the organic growth. In fact, we're about 40 to 50% below what we would need to be at levels that would sustain and just meet that organic growth. And so you see the results of that, right? You see home values going up, which if you're a homeowner is good <laughs> uh, if you're selling, but if you're buying, then it's prohibitive. Um, we're seeing rents rise. And, and you can look back at these long-term trends. If, if you go back and look at incomes not keeping up with the increases in rents. You can see this trend that spans more than 40 years. Um, and what we're seeing is, is that curve is even rising faster in these last several years because of such a shortage of uh, available housing of any type on the market. And so those are some really big key issues, I think, more from a systemic level of what's happening. Um, I think one of the big challenges in local communities is that um, we're often not aware of what the issues of uh, lack of affordable housing look like. Yes, we might see folks that would be chronically homeless and, and associate those individuals or families experiencing homelessness. That's the visible side that most often we think about. But we don't really often pay attention to issues around affordability and cost burden and being overcrowded that are more visible when you look at 
um, say multiple cars being parked. You might see something visible like cars being parked on the lawn and just think that, well, they must really like cars uh, without really thinking that there might be three or four families living in that one particular home um, due to affordability. And, and so I think creating more awareness around one of those uh, more subtle but still visible signs of, of um, housing shortages and, and challenges. Certainly in the affordable spectrum that we work within, you know, that all three organizations work within in that kind of um, zero to 80% of area median income uh, target, which if you're not familiar with area median incomes, 80% of area median income for a family of four is about $52,000, $53,000 a year in Yakima County. So when we look at targeting very low income families, you know, we're looking at a family of four that makes about twenty seven. dollars to $28,000 a year, right? And so um, when you look at rent affordability or trying to get into home ownership opportunities, those create real barriers. Um, and for the reasons that have previously been mentioned, right? You see cost increases, wage increases going up um, and that impacts just the, the reality at, at, at any income level of the cost of construction on homes. So just wanted to share you know some of those challenges i think the positive side is that there are solutions to affordable housing this isn't a problem where we're waiting to discover a vaccine for instance like we know and understand what the solution is um, the one of the key issues of course is lack of resources to adequately address that um, but that's this isn't just a uh, you know, a nonprofit sector issue. This takes partnerships with, uh, again, to address the shortage of housing stock, we need builders at all income levels. We need additional homes um, at the high end, at the medium end, and at the low end. Uh, it's not just a nonprofit problem, um, and we're not just going to, um, you know, build this out with uh, state, local, and, and public uh, funding sources. We, this is more of an all-hands-on-deck uh, need across the sectors. Um, but that said, there are things that can help benefit us here locally that in, increases our competitiveness for these uh, state and, um, and private dollars, especially through the low income housing tax credit program. So uh, as Lowell mentioned, you know, things like a housing levy or a, a one tenth of 1% sales tax. Um, those are some options that uh, none of us like uh, paying additional taxes, uh, but those are some small um, tools that allow us to, as developers, um, we can receive awards of 100000 or 200000 that might help leverage a multi-million dollar development using outside investment. And so that brings additional uh, investment into those communities. It creates jobs through construction. It creates a tax base and it increases the disposable income of all of the families and residents that would live there. Uh, and so there are uh, you know, broad community impacts to, to those types of strategies. Um, so um, I think you know, the challenge in, in our current environment is that so many different things get viewed through um, political lenses uh, or private versus nonprofit sectors. And, and as Lil and Melanie mentioned, like this is really, uh, the need and issues around affordable housing really need to be reviewed as, uh, as a from a community lens perspective of coming together and looking at what we can do collectively through, uh, through partnerships. Um, and again, I'll, I'll point to Leanne because she's a fantastic example with uh, Yakima Savings and Loan, so Yakima Federal Savings and Loan, is that uh, they are great community partners. They're invested uh, I think in all three of our organizations at different points. And so it's it's looking at lending institutions like that, um, building relationships with construction companies and contractors to work on uh, you know, favorable pricing to where we can get it. Um, those types of partnerships that really uh, will help us. Um, one of the challenges really quickly before um, that we see in rural communities is as a nonprofit housing provider, we can only build the type of housing that gets funded, uh, which means we don't necessarily, we acknowledge that there's a wider range of individuals and populations that need affordable housing. Um, but for all of us, we compete for the same funding score sources that are based on competitive scoring. 
Um, and those priorities are often determined uh, like by the state legislature, for instance, or the state housing finance commission. And so, so we compete on those levels. And, and so while there's a greater need for just general affordable low income housing, we often can't get that funded through the funding sources that are available to us. And so that is a challenge that we work at from the policy perspective, but we're all very active, I think, in those uh, policy types issues. Um, but but it, that, that's a challenge. I know that's a challenge when we go into rural communities because they wanna serve a population. Um, and it's a challenge for us uh, as housing providers um, in terms of being able to meet just that broad spectrum of need that we see in, in our local communities. So. Okay, thank you. That was um, very enlightening to me. And um, I think we just have a few minutes left. So Jennifer, do you want to um, open it up for questions? I haven't seen anything come through the chat specifically. Since we're nearing the end of our formal uh, meeting time, what I'd like to do is if Lowell, Brian, and Melanie are willing to stay on after the official adjournment time for questions, uh, if you could just give me a nod or a, a thumbs up if you're able to stay on for additional questions after that time. Okay, excellent. Thank you for doing so. So what we'll do is uh, we'll wrap up uh, as we continue on through the end of our program. First of all, I want to thank our speakers very much for joining us today. And in honor of you speaking, we're going to make a donation in each of your names to our Yakima Rotary Charities that supports the good work we do in the community. You're obviously doing good work too. I hope you'll consider joining us for a future meeting. And certainly we're always looking for new members too. Just uh, no pressure, no pressure at all. But again, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you, Leanne, for bringing the panel to us today. So moving forward, we have our final segment, our Rotarians are going places with Connie Phelan. Well, hello everybody. Hi, President Jennifer and all you Rotarians. It's October 1st and we have some Rotarians going places. Um, today I'd like to announce, we all know and love Sherry Bissell who has been at Northwest Harvest for seven years doing incredible things for Northwest Harvest. And they are so going to miss her because she's taken a huge opportunity to join what we know as Anderson Rock. It's formerly Anderson Rock, now owned by DTG Recycle. And let me tell you, Yakima is going to benefit a huge, huge way by um, DTG being around and offering some recycling services. One thing, if you have a chance, go out on their website and check out some of the really cool things that DTG it, Recycle is doing. One thing I'll, I'll note is that they'll take um, construction items like sheetrock, they recycle it, and then our farmers actually use some of that recycle uh, materials to uh, make their farms better. So I thought that was just su a super cool thing. Um, one, um, so Sherry's going to be the territory relationship manager. And um, as we all know, she's very involved in the community. She's a superstar. She worked at um, KIMA and KNDO uh, for a combined 23 years in advertising. So she's going to, we're going to see her face more and more out there. She's been married to her husband, Brad, for 29 years. And if you know Brad, that's an awesome thing. <laughs> he is a great, funny guy. They are a great couple. They have two children, Zach, 26, and Dylan, 20. And um, she loves to golf. She loves to be out in the mountains. She loves watching football. And as you know, Sherry is di a, a superstar for our being a Rotarian. So. That's all I have. If you any of you have um, Rotarians going places, please let me know and we will announce that in uh, further meetings. So thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so very much, Connie. So next week's program, we're going to be joined by Terry Pierce with the Washington Youth Academy. The following week will be Brandon Nichols to talk about private equity in agriculture. And then following that, Dr. Andrew Sund with Heritage University will be speaking on issues with universities and higher education. So look forward to those programs. 
Before we adjourn, one more reminder, Operation Harvest, put it on your porch on Saturday. I failed to mention a thank you to all of those who have been holding up signs and a thank you to David McKinney, who was also out there all day with us last Friday to hand out some signs. He did put in the chat that he's got some extra yard signs available. So if you could use a yard sign to put up outside prior to Saturday, please let him know. And again, thank you everybody for all your hard work with Operation Harvest. As you know, the need is certainly great in our community and we really appreciate your efforts. So with that, we're going to formally adjourn. And for those that wish to stay on with some additional questions, please direct them to our speakers. <laughs>